So SPX is not outperforming gold. It's going sideways. So it's like you're going on the highway. You're going 100 miles an hour upwards. But before you go in reverse, you have to slow down, right? You have to slow down. And then once you slow down, then you have a chance of going backwards. So this is what's happening, actually. It's the loss of upwards momentum. And goodness, if ever this 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 uh, line breaks, man, this you're, you're in the final capital, like in the fourth capital rotation event. It could Welcome back to Metals and Miners. I'm its founder and its host, Gary Bohm. Today, we have a great discussion lined up, and we're fortunate to have with us Patrick Kareem. Patrick is a master chart trader and has been trading since 2008. He utilizes scientific weight of evidence market analysis, and he incorporates risk and money management techniques. He's the co-founder of NorthStarBedCharts.com. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Gary. I, I don't know that word master. Who, who did I write master? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was on your website. All well, right. Well, let's let's begin with your stated thesis that gold, silver, and the miners only have a bull market kickoff when there's a capital rotation event. Yes. Would you speak into that for us? Yes, yes. SPX, US indices, stocks measured in real terms, priced in gold since 1884. And I know gold was pegged prior to 1970, but they did re-peg it exactly when we had a uh, when the SPX started really rolling over the Dow Jones when you had that uh, the what's the name of that crash we had in the 1930s there the is there like a, the Great Depression crash when yeah. every, when that rolled over even if gold was pegged these the the market forces were so powerful that they still had to unpeg gold to a higher level to account for the destruction of purchasing power that they had to do to save the U.S. equities. So this was the first capital rotation event in favor of gold. So essentially, SPX goes up, up. It's in a bull run. The go-go 20s, everybody's uh, you know making tons of money. Then there's a rollover. Gold outperforms as U.S. equities go sideways. But look at that. After that, U.S. equities, they went 10 years, 20 years. Like a long time it took for U.S. equities to bottom and start moving up. But then after that, we had the bull run in U.S. equities outpricing gold in the in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the the nifty 50, right? Like, you know, uh, the stocks could not do no wrong until again, we had a topping pattern. I'm just going to move this thing here. We had a topping pattern, a rounded topping pattern, and then U.S. equities started slowing down and priced in gold, the U.S. equities actually started breaking down. That's the second capital rotation event. And then after that, we all know silver went bonkers, the miners went bonkers, crude oil went bonkers, uranium, everything, commodities went bonkers during the 70s. And U.S. equities, they just went sideways. They had a couple of uh, stints, 40% drawdown, 50% drawdown. U.S. equities just went nowhere going sideways until they go in the new bull run. And this is the 80s. This is like one of the greatest bull runs for U.S. equities ever out uh, outperforming gold all the way up until we have the dot-com bubble top very acute top and after that rising trend line breakdown slowing of momentum again what do we have gold silver miners uranium copper uh, insert your favorite commodity that had a great run from the 2000s all the way to 2011 that was the third capital rotation event so why is it this important because now we're approaching the fourth one it's it's happening now ish uh, U.S. equities are rolling over. The uh, small cap stocks already rolling, rolling over price in gold. Uh, the Dow Jones already showing more weakness than SPX. But I'm looking at the strongest of the strong. So SPX, when SPX and the Nasdaq roll over price in gold, and I did this chart a while back there. This is from April 27th. I think it's rolled over even more today. Here it is today. It's really, we're losing upwards momentum. So these rising trend lines, Essentially, what they're telling you, the steeper they are, the more the powerful the momentum is going upwards. But once you start losing them and you start losing more and more uh, horizontal support, it's more and more important. It's more meaningful, the breakdown. And this is SPX. Got, look, price in gold. Back test. It's not going up. So SPX is not outperforming gold. It's going sideways. So it's like you're going on the highway. You're going 100 miles an hour upwards. But before you go in reverse, you have to slow down, right? 
you have to slow down. And then once you slow down, then you have a chance of going backwards. So this is what's happening, actually. It's the loss of upwards momentum. And goodness, if ever this 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 uh, line breaks, man, this you're, you're in the final capital, like in the fourth capital rotation event. It could even happen. It depends how how closely we're looking at it to really spot the evidence. But there's there's support. As these support lines get broken down every single time, you're closer and closer to having that that new trend, right? Once the price of the SPX price in gold starts uh, trending below a declining 12-month moving average, below a declining 36-month moving average, then we just, it's it's a new trend, guys, and you don't want to fight it, right? Growth stocks will take, they, they might do well growth stocks nominally, price in fiat, but price in other assets, price in gold, they will have definitely a much harder time. And so, so if somebody wants to invest, they always want to go in the outperforming asset classes. So Patrick, if that capital rotation occurs, as you're describing, what time period in history would you point to as a corollary for the gold and silver miners in terms of their growth and returns potential? Okay, well, all right. So again, I'll have to share. Uh, where did I have this chart? Okay, so here's... Okay, I'm going to pop up this one again. I'm going to put the gold and silver miners right here for you guys. So as a chart, essentially, it's like the JDX guys, but it has data going back all the way to the 1960s, right? And I'm going to invert the little chart. Okay, here it is. All right. So what I have in the background is I flipped the SPX versus gold chart. So in the background, you have this black line here. Let me log. Let me just scoot that for you guys. All right. So up here, guys, we have essentially gold versus SPX. I just flipped it. So if that's going up, it's gold breaking out versus SPX. So when gold outperforms SPX, when we have a capital rotation event where gold outperforms SPX, look look at the miners chart. Look at that. Look, Gary, how, how it tracks. Look in the 70s. That's oh my, it's like, if you want to know what the, the gold and silver miners react to, it's not just gold price because people say, hey, gold's at 2,500. How come my miners aren't back above all-time highs, right? It's because when you ask that yourself that question, you have to accept that maybe I'm not looking at the best chart to tell me what it, the miners track, what the miners recorded at. But when I saw that gold versus SPX chart, I overlaid the miners and look at that. Look at look at this in the 70s. I know that for my miners to go bonkers, they have they'll have way more tailwinds than headwinds if gold is up for me SPX. And look at that here. Look at that. Look in the 2000s. Gary, goodness. Look at that. The miners, they track gold's out capacity to outperform SPX. Gold's capacity to steal that hedge fund money away from the SPX that's going back into gold. That much more outperformance by gold is with the miners. And look at that. So this that's is the miners today. Incredible corollary. So you're thinking both the 70s and 2000s. Yes. Um, yes. And, yeah. And look at that. This is the nom. So this is my breakout line for the the miners nominally. It's right there. It's moving up higher. Look, I I know guys, miners are up fifty percent off the bottom. But for me, the fifty percent off the bottom, this fifty percent there that we're doing here off the bottom, it's the equivalent of this fifty percent off the bottom we did here. It's the, the equivalent of the fifty percent. But what this is three hundred percent. This is three hundred percent. So what I'm looking at as a chart trader is low risk high reward entries. And you cannot have an uptrend without higher lows. You cannot have an uptrend without higher highs. So I know in hindsight, oh, I called the bottom. I don't try to do that anymore because I want price to go up 50% because I'm going to try to capture this move up, this 300% move up. That's my target. Speaking of higher highs um, or higher lows, it looks to me like um, where your cursor is if you come down to about 2017-ish, the low in 2017, right, uh, right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, it looks like we're making, we're stair-stepping ah, up. Yes, right ah, super bullish. So, okay, super bullish. Yeah, there you the, go. The setup is super bullish. So what's happening here is, I have another famous saying is, you never front run a possible breakout. You can't uh, score a touchdown without, you know, going five yards, 10 yards, going through the moves until like you're, you're in the 20 yard and then you could try to, to, to do, you have a higher probability of doing a touchdown, right? The Hail Mary stuff, it's low probability stuff. It looks great. So this 
this pattern, this is a coiling consolidating pattern. When the price action goes like that sideways for five, 10, 14 years, the moving averages are starting to get coiled and tight. So, but as soon as the price goes above this line, it, tell, the, it tells me that we're doing a higher high. The move, so now the price is above the moving averages. So mathematically, objectively, if the moving, if I'm above an inclining moving average, that means my price points are above mm -hmm. that and distancing themselves from that moving average. That, that's an uptrend. That's, you cannot make gains if the price doesn't go up away from your entry point. You just can't, right? So mm -hmm. when that breaks out, Gary, and there's a high likelihood that that, if it breaks out, it's sniffing out that the, this line will also break upwards in favor of gold. Man, that is a precious metals bull era, not bull market, bull era. So you get the tailwinds, the dips, you buy the dips, you buy the consolidations, you buy all that stuff because they have a higher likelihood of resolving upwards. I know for and, the folks who want, who follow you and who follow uh, us at Metals and Miners, that will be very exciting. Oh, goodness. That, that era. So let's talk about the yield curve here. Speaking to that, um, historically, it's not the lead up to or the day of uninversion that signals a recession, but rather the bear steepening afterward when and if that happens. So now that the yield curve has uninverted, do you expect a rapid bear steepening like in times past propelling us into a recession? Guys, so this up here is the 10 minus the two year um, chart. I have the recessions here. These are like the, the green overlays. These are recessions. Mm -hmm. So when, and guys, I did this one a while back there. So now we're close to zero right here. In hindsight, this is a high likelihood, higher likelihood right now that this was the bottom down here. I think we're right close to zero right now. When the yield curve uninverts, Sometimes you have the recession, like right on it, 1990 here, 1990, 91 recession. It was right when that thing started going upwards. Uh, sometimes it's much it's a few months later in the 2008, that thing on uninverted. And we, we had a blast off. Silver still went up, uh, leading into the recession. A whole bunch of the you know commodities were still like going up. It's really just when the U.S. equities really started melting down that it, it dragged down everything with it. Here's the two the the 2020 March Madness yield curve breaks out to the upside. So I'm not, yes, it, let's say uninverts, it goes back above zero. Fine. That's just step one, but you can't front run any yeah. catastrophe fear event until the actual price chart tells you that there's really something going badly. The NASDAQ is still above its three year moving average, right? It's still above rising trend lines. So you gotta, you say, okay, now I have a setup where there's a possibility of having this catastrophe event, having the, this 2008 type crash, having a, a severe recession, the unemployment, goodness, the unemployment also has started, uh, you know, going upwards. Mm -hmm. I'll show you just th this chart here. Unemployment starting going upwards. I just posted it today. And look, I could have overlaid the 10 minus two year, minus the two year yield on this chart. It would have practically been the same. So here I have the gold versus SPX, I have the unemployment rate, and I could have put the 10 minus two, and here's the the, un, the um, recession overlays. Whenever, like this spooks the Fed, unemployment, initial claims, uh, the yield curve un, uninverting. The setup's there, Gary. It's just there, the setup. Now the rate cuts happen like practically not all the time, but most times the rate cut happens when that unemployment starts going up. Mm -hmm. But before starting to short the markets, it's like, that's not the time for it. We're just there. We see the setup. And again, the gold versus SPX chart tracks that. And we know what the miners track. They track the gold versus SPX chart. So if you put one plus one plus one, you, you get you get three, right? So we're, it's called like the weight of evidence. Like you said, like what we like to look at, the weight of evidence. We're building that evidence that, the breakout that we, the next breakout we have in the miners will be a legit one, which should be bought. You know, it's like, it won't be too late guys. I know I hear that sometimes. Oh, I have to load up before because once it takes off, I, I can't get on guys that stop scaring yourself like that. There's a lot of time to get on because if your, your thesis is really that there's a 10 year bull run and the, the goal to SPX chart, when that thing breaks out, it doesn't break out to stop two years later, it breaks out to run eight years, 10 years, you know, it, it's a long, meaningful breakout. So mm -hmm. guys, please don't be scared about 
you know, waiting for the breakout, you wait for the breakout. And then even if you like you left, I'm putting in quotes there, air quotes, you left 50% on the table. That doesn't matter because that's the price to pay to know that the 300, 400%, five year, six year, eight year, 10 year bull run that you'll have after is more likely to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're close to it. All right. So Patrick, let's talk about long-term inflation. So according to the recent University of Michigan consumer survey data, the average U.S. consumer believes that inflation will be 6.1% over the next five to 10 years. However, the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities tips market, on the other hand, indicates that CPI will only be 2.1% during that time. So clearly, consumers are believing that inflation will be higher than the government believes it or says that it will. In your analysis, what are the charts telling you about long-term inflation? Oil is sniffing out right now. It actually peaked before inflation started going down. It knew like the market, the ag I love looking at the market instruments, financialized instruments, because the aggregate of market participants for me are like, they're so much smarter than any one analysis, any anyone chart, right? The aggregate market participants will start pricing in mm -hmm. all these macro events or macro fundamentals, you know, and discount them pretty much appropriately. And the fact that gold, that oil spiked and then inflation kept going up and oil's going down right now, it's sniffing the, all, the, all this inflation there that's been going down there. It sniffed it a, a, ahead of time. So this is from a TA perspective, oil right now, is on massive support. It has to survive this. So this is a quarterly, quarterly log chart. I could have wicks below the zone. And as long as it closes the quarter back above, I'm fine with it. If you don't want to have a, a massive disinflation or deflation event, you want oil to stick around this. For me, like if oil breaks out here, it's probably going to break out before inflation, uh, before like inflation starts rising up again, right? Mm -hmm. So this, for me, is what you like. What you want to be looking at. There, a huge component of this uh, CPI is like the energy. But here is the oil price. I'll show you this. This chart is like a, a one-stop shop there for understanding the macro of the inflation rate. So here I have the pr U.S. purchasing power. That's the the black line, but inverted. So if that black thick black line is going up, that means purchasing power is going down. But I also have the oil price from 1861 right here. And you'll see that oil price tracks inversely purchasing power. So the more oil yeah. price crescendos upwards, the more purchasing power goes down over long periods of time. And sometimes there's readjustments and breakouts. But the bottom pane, I have the inflation rate. So the inflation rate is that green overlay. Below zero, you have the, you have deflation, negative inflation. And as inflation rate goes down here, that's disinflation. But you'll see that the ebbs and flow of the oil price. So if oil ha price has a surge, the inflation rate also goes up, right? It has its waves going up. Look at that here, oil price going down. Look at the look at how it tracks at certain periods the inflation rate pretty accurately. A rush in oil price, a rush in inflation rate, right? Oil price here in the run, inflation rate had upwards spikes, right? Here, oil price crashes. We have deflation here heading into uh, uh, in the period right here, 2008, 2009 goes down. Oil price rockets upwards. Look at that. We had that huge inflation. So this chart I did uh, January 7th. So oil has been sniffing out or tracking the lowering inflation rate. So I would probably so some people some people are saying we're going to have a deflationary impulse. Are you seeing that in the charts? Ah, well, the setup's there for that. There's no denying that if oil it's on support right now, it could have an interquarter spike all the way down, I don't know, like $30, $40, $50 below that 60 and hopefully the the Fed or whoever like the market participants step in and they're able to sniff out that there will be inflation and then that gets bought up and we close above that $70 level. But I don't want to see a quarterly close below 70 because that means structurally there's going to be something more important is playing out. If we have a quarterly close below that, that uh, $69 level, like let's say we start closing the quarter at 68, 67, that's the market telling us this could probably be a new downtrend in oil prices. That's going to need time to heal before we do have that inflationary, uh, the awesome. cycle re resume upwards, but the setups there, it's coiling tight. The market participants, they're like, what's going to happen? But they're 
we just have to look at the oil price. If oil price breaks out, then that's it. Inflationary cycle on the table right now. Uh, four, five, six, seven, eight percent inflation, whatever you want to put, we're going to have one of these 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 green waves up. But if the price does break down, then we're looking at these a possibility of the, having these a red stent like here, you know, where, where we have actually deflation there. So okay. it's it's I don't want to be the guy who plays both sides, but that's yeah. what it is when you're in a pattern, a, a triangle, a consulting pattern. That's what the market's telling you. It's like. It's cool for us because it's setting us an opportunity to make money or gains, right? On the upside or downside, the setup's building up. All you have to do is just be a little bit patient and just wait for the market to tell you what direction it's going to take. So, Patrick, let's discuss NVIDIA and the markets, okay? NVIDIA has grabbed so much market share this year. Their market cap has surged past $3 trillion. They have literally single-handedly driven the market to new heights. Based on your analysis, are they now in a position where it's something like when NVIDIA breaks down, all heck breaks loose? <laughs> yes. Well, look at this. Look, just to scare people, that's the linear chart. We should never, if ever you see somebody plot something that has moved logarithmically, but they show the linear chart, they're trying to, to, to scare you, right? Because that looks really like it has to crash. But once you put on the log chart, it's not... It is acute, but it's not as it doesn't look as bad, right? Because that thing has been moving logarithmically. But here, okay, this this is a a, a tool I love to to use. There, we we use at North Shore Bad Charts. It's distance from moving average. It's how far can you stretch from the mean? And here, it's how far could I stretch from that thirty six month moving average? I'll remove that. That's the red line here. And historically, every time it's stretched from that thirty six month moving average. It doesn't mean the price doesn't go up. It can't go up anymore, but it means the price won't has a high chance of not going up as fast. And once it starts breaking down, so once you're stretched and you start breaking down from that, then look at that here, right there, here, start breaking down, breaking down. I'm going to zoom in for you guys. Once you start breaking down, then you're in that scenario where the momentum, the capital flows are leaving that. Oh, goodness, look at that. Gary, as we speak, if it closes the month here, that's a confirmed momentum breakdown. Look at look at these momentum breakdowns once I've had them. Look it's at that. Clear. Print was sideways down. As soon as that momentum broke down, even if we didn't break a rising trend line yet, the momentum told you that you had a higher likelihood of going sideways or down. The way I see it is when momentum breaks down, it's the market telling you you're, you're entering a correction. All market tops always start with a correction that eventually fails. Sometimes people like, let's say I, I'd be, I'd have a position in NVIDIA. As soon as there's a correction, my bias, my brain's going to say, oh, that's bullish correction, right? It's a bullish flag. It's going to resolve upwards, right? We cheat ourselves. But honestly and objectively, if, as soon as you enter a correction, you have to accept that that correction could be the market top. There's probably a probability that it will just resolve upwards. But there's also opportunity cost, you know, like this thing, NVIDIA kept going up a little bit, but eventually I had a hard time. So now. So when it comes down to that moving average, let's say it's going to come down to the moving average, which is where the other two breakdowns yes. occurred. What's the, what's that level there? How far of a, of a decline is that? Let's check it out. Label, put it back. Yeah. So you see, that's a, well, right now we're at 200%. So the moving average keeps going up. So it depends how fast it goes there because our correction is time and or price, right? It could go down fast, try to hog that three-year moving average, which is right now at uh, $45, or it could just take time, right? And just like, we like go sideways, let that moving average catch up. And that also is healthy. Both scenarios could happen, but right now a hard, a hard fall, could be 50, 60 percent. Oh, goodness. Yes, yes, yes. What, that, what, kind uh, of, what kind of impact to the broader markets would would a S&P, I mean, would a uh, NVIDIA drop of 50 to 60 percent bring? Well, look here, I'm going to overlay the uh, the NASDAQ. So it's pretty much they're both the same one and the same, right? Here's the NASDAQ, NVIDIA. And yeah, that could that could be a hard drop. You'd have to do an in, individual, you know, um evaluation for the nasdaq how i understand how but i mean you know if we were to ballpark it could we uh, say it would it, it could be a 25 percent drop yes. it could be a 40 percent drop. Or... i'd say 20. 20 right now i just i, I just popped up uh, the nvidia the nasdaq chart about 20 percent drop to hit that three or moving average 
So yeah, that's a pretty uh, important correction there. And the thing is, once you've dropped 20%, then you need time to heal, right? The last time it did it, like in 2021, it dropped the whole bunch here. That's uh, I'm back on the NASDAQ here. Mm -hmm. Why is my writing white here? It dropped uh, 37%, 30%. Well, there's opportunity costs on the way down. And then there's opportunity costs on the way up to just even get back at nominal highs, right? Mm -hmm. So, but this is a setup because we need this. If you want, look, every one of those, not every one, um, oh, did I close them? The the goal to SPX was capital rotation events. They're instigated by a 40% drop in US equities, right? Once the market starts dropping 10%, 15%, and the market participants know that this is not going to stop until it drops 40%, that's when gold holds its ground and breaks out versus SPX. That's when silver tracks that. That's when the miners track that. So you need a 40% drop. You need something fundamentally to structurally to scare the, these pension, all the, the people who allocate these trillions of dollars to say, oh goodness, like growth is dead for now. I need to reallocate into energy or to these other sectors in the SPX. And you, you, you need a bear market. You need a 40% bear market in, in SPX there to, to really start a bull era for precious metals. So it's hard to call right now, but uh, the setup's there again. So, so, yeah, it looks like it's there, especially with NVIDIA having played such a huge role in the run up. It's likely to play a role in the, in the, in the run down. And it's so far stretched past its moving average that, like you say, the setup is really there. But Patrick, staying on this, in a recent post, you stated that there's really zero reason to be scared of a major stock market, a, a stock bear market. What are you seeing there? And I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It is free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners and all the expert interviews that we conduct, just like this one, they're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us. Also positive that you've enjoyed this conversation with Patrick as much as I have. Please let him know. Hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video.